Hello and welcome back. So what I want to do today is look at methods for transferring heat. And in particular, look at a component that's become quite common in modern day high performance electronics. That is of course the heat pipe. So what I want to do today is look at why this thing is needed in the first place, look at how it's built, how it works, what are the operating principles behind it, but then also look at its performance and its limitations. So what are the best conditions to use this sort of device in and when it doesn't work that well. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Let's start off by remembering a few things about heat transfer. Now for heat transfer to occur, you need a heat source, so a hot body, and you need a cold body, so an object to which heat will transfer to. And this in most cases is the ambient air. So if you have some sort of electronic circuit that heats up, all the heat will be dissipated into the air around it. Now the temperature at which the hot body will stabilize at is dependent on the temperature of the cold body, so the hot body will always stay slightly hotter than the cold body, it can never go below that temperature, but it will also depend on the power you need to dissipate, so there's not much you can do about that, if the circuit has to dissipate a certain amount of power then it will have to dissipate it, but one more important parameter here is the thermal resistance between the two bodies. And the exact value of this can be modified. So this depends on the thermal interface between the two components. And well, the exact temperature will depend on these parameters. So to get better cooling, you will need a small thermal resistance, or in other words, you will need good heat exchange between the two bodies. So one method to obtain that is to use better conducting materials. So for example, aluminum is good at conducting heat, but copper is even better. But it's more expensive, so it's not that widely used. On the other hand, another thing that is critical to improving heat transfer is surface area. So the main reason why a small heat sink is not as good as a large heat sink is because the large heat sink also has larger surface area. But it's important to point out here that surface area alone is not enough to obtain low thermal resistance. I mean, a piece of aluminum foil, which is made from aluminum, which is a good thermally conductive material, doesn't really make a good heat sink, even though it has a lot of surface area. And that is because once you have a heat source and you're trying to cool it down, the foil itself is not that good at spreading the heat through itself. So it lacks thermal conduction. So the main mechanism by which heat gets transferred from the hot body to the ambient air, so for example from the microprocessor's junction, is first of all through heat conduction through the solid, so from the junction to the case of the processor, then to the heat sink, heat spreads out through conduction through the heat sink, and from there it's transferred to the air around it through the surface area, and then the air moves around by convection. So to get the heat from the junction to the air, an important part of the heat sink's working mechanism is the heat conduction through itself. And this of course is a limited process. You need quite a lot of material to get good heat conduction. That's why heat sinks are usually built either with very thick fins, for example this heat sink has very few fins but very thick, or you can build a heat sink with a very thick core and then have a bunch of fins that increase its surface area to allow for heat exchange. This for example being widely used with processor heat sinks. Now to this sort of heat sink you can also add a fan to create force convection, so to move the air around, which will further lower its thermal resistance. But one of the key aspects to getting this sort of ensemble to work efficiently is that you need to place it directly on top of your heat source. So to have this thing directly on top of the processor. Now this is quite a large thing, but in a device such as a desktop computer, well it's not really a problem. I mean you have space for your processor cooler, you have space for your graphics card cooler, maybe some other heat sinks in there, they all have room. So 
having multiple constructions like this is not a problem. But in a device that is far more restricted on space, for example, laptop computer, you don't really have the luxury of putting heat sinks and fans everywhere you want. So the main method by which that sort of device can be cooled is to take the heat from the heat source over a certain distance to where you can actually put a heat sink in. And the problem with this is that normal conduction would not be sufficient. So even if you put a bar of copper in between the heat sink and the heat source, well, because of the thermal resistance of the copper bar, you will not get heat there efficiently. Now, in things like automobiles or, well, expensive PCs, you have a thing called liquid cooling. So you have your hot component and rather than heating up the air with it or the heat sink, you heat up a liquid with which it is in contact, so for example water, then you take the liquid to wherever you can put a heat sink in, so with the car you take heat from the engine to the front radiator, where you cool down the liquid and then you move it back to the heat source again and while well, the cycle continues. Now the only problem with this mechanism is that well you need a pump first of all to move the liquid around and if you have any sort of leaks then well your electronic circuit would be destroyed so having this thing in a car is not that dangerous but having it in a computer well it can have its drawbacks but other than that the whole system will be quite large so because you need one way pipes and then the other and then you need your pump there it will become quite a large device I mean, you can build it, but again, this is usually used in things like desktop PCs. You don't really see this in laptops, because you don't have the space to do something like this. If only there was a way to get the heat transfer to be done using some sort of fluid, but without using this large pump. So some sort of passive way of taking heat from the heat source to the cooler, and then take the liquid or the fluid back again. Well, this is where the heat pipe comes into play. Now, a heat pipe is a device that doesn't just rely on fluid movement to transport heat, it also relies on the phase transition of the fluid. So you need far less energy to heat up a liquid or a gas by one degree, then you need to change the phase of the liquid into a gas. So for example, in the case of water, to heat up one kilogram by one degree of gaseous water, you need about 1.8 kilojoules, and to heat up one kilogram of liquid water by one degree, you need about 4.2 kilojoules, so roughly similar amounts. But to take one kilogram of water from a liquid state to a gaseous state, you need 2.2 megajoules of energy. So a completely different scale of energy is required to change the phase compared to just heating up the substance. Now taking water in the form of gas from point A to point B can be done passively because, well, a gas will fill up all available space around it, so you don't really have to do anything and gas will just spread out. But taking liquid water from point A to point B without using any extra exterior force can be done by capillary action. So this is a phenomenon in which if you have very tight spaces and with very large surface area, Liquids can just stick to these and, well, go up, even against gravity. So, for example, this is what happens when you put something like a napkin in ink. Even though, well, gravity is pulling the ink down, because of capillary action, the ink will go up through the napkin. And we can rely on the same exact principle with our heat pipes. So, a heat pipe is, well, a pipe. It's an enclosed space in which, on one end, you apply heat that will vaporize the liquid inside, the gas will flow through the entire space of the pipe up until a point where it can condense, so to form back into a liquid, and then by capillary action the liquid will go back to the hot region and then re-evaporate. So you'll have a continuous cycle that does not need any external energy to operate it. This allows heat pipes to be made very very thin, very very small, you don't need extra pumps or anything, and you can find a bit more detail in this datasheet I have here, so I will be leaving a link to this in the description. But now it's time to see if this thing actually works. 
so to see what kind of benefit you actually get from having this liquid inside of the pipe. And for that, I prepared the setup right here. So what I have here is two constant voltage loads, so I prepared these for an older video, you can check that out if you're curious. And basically what these are doing are creating a constant power dissipation on a couple of transistors. So you have exactly 5 volts on each of the circuits, and well we have the same current running through both of them. So right now 5 volts times 200 milliamps, we have 1 watt. And throughout the experiment I will go through multiple watts to see exactly how the system behaves. Now the transistors are directly soldered onto a heat pipe, and then the heat pipe has a standard passive cooler glued to it onto the other end. So this would be the normal use case where you have the heat source on one side and then the heat sink somewhere else. And well to get something interesting out of the experiment, one of the heat pipes I've broken, so I let all the liquid inside out, there's a big hole on the side of it, so what I wanted was to create a system where one of the heat pipes actually works like a heat pipe and the other one only works like a bar of copper. So there's no special conductive properties built into it. And to perform the measurement, I also added two thermocouples to the transistors to see exactly what the temperature on the case is, and we will also compare this to what we can see using the infrared camera. So now, let's turn to some results. So first off, we can see what happened with 1 watt being dissipated. So you can see about 53 degrees being measured with the multimeter, and while well, the infrared camera is measuring 47, so roughly the same value. With the other transistor, we have 63 degrees, and then 48, so there is a bit of tolerance in between the two values. But interestingly enough, if we now focus on the temperatures on the radiators, so we can see that for the heatsink with the working heat pipe, the temperature of the radiator is about 44 degrees, whereas the temperature of the transistor is 47. So we only have 3 degrees Celsius difference between the heatsink and the transistor, which are about 10 centimeters apart. Whereas on the other side, where the heat sink is only connected to a copper bar, so there is no more liquid in the heat pipe, it's not working properly, we can see that the transistor is running at about 58 degrees, whereas the heat sink is at 38 degrees. So we have a huge 20 degree temperature difference between the two. If we move on to the next measurement, so at 2 watts, we can see that, well, my second multimeter isn't really measuring correctly, so we see only 79 degrees here whereas the infrared camera is telling us it's 88 degrees, so maybe my thermocouple wasn't making proper contact. But again, if we compared the temperatures between the transistor and the heatsink, we can see that with the working heat pipe, between 0.2 and 3, we have only 4 degrees, whereas with the non-working heat pipe, we have 30-something degrees between the two. So our temperature difference is increasing. So similar story for 3 watts, we move on to 4 watts, so at this point my infrared camera is starting to reach its limits, so we have quite a large temperature on the transistor with the broken heat pipe. So here we have more than 70 degrees of temperature difference between the transistor and the heat sink, whereas for the working heat pipe we only see about 7. So what these experiments are showing us is that with the heat pipe you don't have that much of a temperature difference between your heat source and the place where you're dissipating the heat. And this is quite normal since the heat pipe doesn't rely on conduction like with the normal bar of copper, but rather it's relying on phase transition. And the important thing to remember about a substance's transitioning between two phases, so between gas and liquid, is that phase transition happens without temperature variation. So for the same temperature you can have both a liquid and a gas. And that is why we can see such a small difference between our heat source and our heat sink. Because at the heat source the substance is vaporizing and at the heat sink it's condensing. Both of these phenomena happening at very similar temperatures. So in effect what the heat pipe is doing is that it's bringing the heat sink closer to the heat source. So even though these are separated by a certain distance. Now there's one more very important aspect that needs to be mentioned. And that is that since the heat pipe relies on fluid movement, especially the liquid fluid, which does occur by capillary action regardless of what way gravity is pointing, 
The thing is, if you want to move the liquid against gravity, it's gonna be harder than to move it together with the gravity. So just to illustrate this point, I prepared this setup in which I only have the single heat pipe, that is actually the heat pipe, and I've placed it vertically with the heat sink below. So we have the heat source on top, this is creating the gas, which condenses on the bottom, and then this needs to rise up through capillary reaction to get re-evaporated. And if we look at how this measurement turned out, we can see that we have roughly 85-86 degrees on the hot spot when I'm dissipating 3 watts, and we have about 78 degrees on the heat sink. So we have about 8 degrees Celsius of temperature difference between the two. Now, if we compare this to our initial experiment, where we had the heat sink standing vertically on the table, here it's the heat pipe on the left side. So here we had about 82 degrees measured with the infrared camera and 84 with the thermocouple. And then for the heat sink, we had about 77. So when the heat pipe was mounted vertically, we had quite a small difference between the two, between the heat sink and the heat source. So we had about 5 degrees Celsius, whereas here we have about 8 degrees. Now the reason why the temperatures are very similar has to do with the way this thing is mounted. So right now it's in free moving gear, so convection can occur much more efficiently. Whereas in the case before, when it was on the table, air didn't really move around that well. Now, I also found some properly made measurements to illustrate this effect. So this is the website of an actual heat pipe manufacturer. And here they have some properly made measurements, so unlike what I did, in which they're illustrating two very important principles about heat pipes. On the one side, they're comparing a horizontally placed heat pipe with a vertically placed heat pipe. And we can see that, so they're measuring different types of heat pipes, different diameters. And one of the things that will be quite obvious is just how much heat you can actually transport through the heat pipe. So with the horizontal one, we have about 88 watts, whereas with the vertical one, the same heat pipe, you're down to about 40 something, 46 watts. So the heat transportation capability of the heat pipe is almost halved when you take it from horizontal to vertical. Another interesting thing that can be observed in these graphs is that the power transport capability is temperature dependent. So depending on the temperature at which you have your heat source, you will have different amounts of heat that the heat pipe can actually transport. So this has to do with how easily the fluids move through the heat pipe itself. The hotter it is, the easier they move. But then at a certain point, you don't really get your condensation effect happening as easily because the water gas is so hot. So after a certain temperature, you can see that heat pipe's efficiency starts to decrease. And of course, at the other end, below zero degrees, well, water freezes, so it won't work. So all in all, heat pipes are quite useful devices when you're in tight spaces and you can't really put your heat sink next to the heat source. And they are quite commonly used in commercial electronics and things like laptops or even high performance CPU coolers, and well in any application where you really need to. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.